Hi, Jack Atchison Jr. here, and welcome to the Wild Sheep Foundation Sheep Week. Uh, this year we're doing it uh, a lot different, but us sheep hunters are always used to uh, dealing with long-range things anyhow. So uh, the Sheep Week's going to be a great way to enjoy your one of your favorite activities and, and visit with friends. And I'm, gonna, I'm here to give a seminar on uh, booking your first sheep hunt. I'm going to cover... Uh, over-the-counter license opportunities here in North America and also in uh, in Asia as well. And, uh, you know, I I grew up sheep hunting starting in uh, uh, 1965 with my dad, and he had a really unusual group of sheep hunting friends. So I was able to go out with uh, the likes of uh, Jack O'Connor and his son Bradford and uh, Elmer Keith, Warren Page, uh, as I got older, uh, I had some of my friends join me as well, like uh, Craig Boddington. We went on uh, uh, an epic sheep hunt with his dad, and he killed a record ram here in Montana. Uh, Jim Zumbo drew a tag as well, and he t killed a whopper as well. Uh, I hunted sheep every year since 65 and spent 30 years as a backpack outfitter in the Beartooth Mountains of uh, Montana, uh, chasing bighorns around and uh, had a ton of fun with a lot of people and enjoyed sheep hunting and, and learning more about uh, the needs of wild sheep. Uh, that led me to uh, want to give back, and I became uh, a Wild Sheep Foundation uh, director and then a chairman of the board and uh, for the National Wild Sheep Foundation. And then I went on to become uh, the uh, chairman of the uh, Wild Sheep Foundation Conservation Committee, and I'm still trying to help keep uh, sheep on the mountain and working at new ways to put them there as well. So uh, my seminar, uh, I'm, I'm hoping it'll help uh, people that uh, are planning uh, their first trip here in North America or if they have interest in going overseas and kind of a short uh, what to do list and what not to do and uh, and things that you should be aware of in planning a, an international or even a, here, a, a trip here in North America. So uh, less talking on my end and let's get on to the seminar and it'll be in a PowerPoint uh, presentation uh, with me filling in the blanks and talking about different things. And if you want to pause uh, the, uh, the presentation at any time to read any of the slides and info, uh, please feel free to do that. After the uh, presentation, we'll have a live chat uh, opportunity where you can get a hold of me and uh, I can help you answer correct questions. And we'll be, uh, this will be up for some weeks. Uh, so uh, uh, I can uh, be at uh, your uh, beck and whim uh, uh, to uh, uh, talk about sheep. And uh, there's nothing I'd rather talk about than wild sheep. Well, here we are, folks. Uh, we're going to start my seminar on uh, planning a wild sheep hunt for success. Uh, I was going to put a sheep uh, photo in there, and I thought, you know, this is about us sheep hunters. So I just put a slide in there of uh, myself, a wild sheep hunter in our native habitat. I, uh, I've, uh, I've worked with wild sheep for years, uh, both professionally and uh, and uh, as a, a passion, basically, uh, I've been uh, a hunting consultant uh, since 1971 and have helped uh, send many people around the globe uh, uh, in search of uh, wild sheep. And uh, uh, I do believe in, uh, you know, if you take one, you need to find a way to put one back. Uh, you know, wild sheep hunting is a uh, is a, I look at it as a pathway to see the natural world and some of the plants most uh, remote locations and home to some really wild beasts and different cultures. It's a, an amazing way to uh, see the world and enjoy uh, uh, your passion of wildlife and hunting. You know, some of the trips are more affordable than you think. For instance, you could go to the Caucasus Mountains on a, a tour and chamois hunt for under $15,000. Uh, there are even some uh, special uh, ibex hunts in the Pamirs of Tajikistan that are uh, over and back. You might spend uh, $12,000 and, and uh, uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. 
I always tell people uh, uh, the the uh, a story that when I was uh, in my uh, uh, late teens, I had saved enough money to uh, buy a, a new pickup truck, and uh, uh, I had five thousand bucks saved, and I was going to buy a truck. And uh, in the door walks Frank Cook, a famous. Uh, uh, stone sheep guide from years gone by and and Frank uh, happened to drop uh, uh, the line that he uh, take a guy hunting for forty eight hundred dollars for 21 days for stone sheep and whatever else you ran into so needless to say I went on the stone sheep hunt and the pickup had to wait and uh, surprisingly if we go forward all almost 50 years uh, that pickup truck uh, that was going to cost me $4,800 and my purchase of the $4,800 stone sheep is still the same thing. A new pickup truck is the same price as a stone sheep hunt. So nothing's changed. You just have to decide if you are that passionate about it and really want to do it. And North America is blessed with the six Capernet native species, you know, Rocky Mountain Bighorns, Mountain Goat, Doll sheep, stone sheep, desert sheep, muskox of all things. They're part of the family tree. And there's some other free-range introduced critters like Audad, Mouflon, Uriol sheep, and uh, Bezor Aurox, uh, ex excuse me, Bezor Ibex. And uh, the, uh, these are over-the-counter tags. Uh, so uh, if, there, if you have a find that you can find a way to make it there, there it's available here, no drawing. Now, Eurasia has really got the market countered on uh, uh, Capernet species. They've got over a hundred different species. Uh, you know, you've got Urioles and wild goats, Ibex, uh, pseudo sheep, uh, and Argales, and uh, all kinds of other different uh, species that you really don't even hear about, uh, like uh, Goral and Seagro and, and uh, uh, some really interesting animals. This is a great shot of one of the most pretty areas in the in the in Tajikistan, uh, Zorokul uh, Nature Preserve. Uh, great habitat for sheep. If you can look at the, these mountains, these are 16, 17,000 foot peaks, and not much grass growing up on the peaks. Those sheep uh, depend on that to feed down on the valley floor. Uh, sheep, wild sheep need quiet spots for them during the winter. Uh, there's uh, sheep. Uh, live on uh, basically 90% of the population survive on 10% of the landscape in the winter. So uh, we have to keep our, our uh, eye on uh, habitat for sheep during the hard times. So where do you start your planning? Uh, basically, uh, you made the right step by joining uh, this uh, seminar and, and uh, being involved with Wild Sheep Foundation. Uh, the Wild Sheep family are very, very uh, uh, friendly folks to deal with and a anxious to help anyone that's interested. But I'd get a hold of all the uh, game departments uh, and discuss, uh, uh, ask for the, uh, the names of the field biologists that are in sheep habitat. They can give you uh, uh, some good uh, uh, non-biased local information on the sheep populations. Uh, the, the Alaska professional hunters and GOABC uh, in BC and Ammo in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon Outfitters Association all have great uh, websites and information on the, on their members uh, and uh, and ways to get a hold of uh, uh, legal qualified outfitters in these areas and uh, and there's also uh, people uh, like myself uh, that uh, are specialized in sheep hunting you can call them up and uh, they can uh, collectively with between all these people you can get a pretty good feel of what might fit your particular criteria. Uh, this is a photo of a, of a horn plug. And this is uh, something the Wild Sheep Foundation came up with years ago. It's a little aluminum pin that they basically drill a hole in, and uh, on that little pin will be the, the year uh, of the harvest, uh, the number associated with the, your sheep. And, uh, and it's a permanent marker, and it's become the, the symbol of a legal harvest of wild sheep in most ranges of the world. So, I mean, this is kind of the objective. If you can uh, get uh, far along enough to get a sheep and do it in a legal manner, uh, 
this is a point you want to be at the end of all your effort. But uh, be sure and uh, talk to your outfitter or your consultants for uh, about all hunt-related costs. Uh, you know, where, to, uh, you, where to get copies of hunting laws and maybe maps of the areas, the hunting concessions or the hunting units. It is your responsibility to know the laws. Uh, ask. This is a really important one. Ask who will be ha helping with any permitting and perhaps import documentation, if, uh, it, and particularly in in uh, overseas hunting and so forth. It is a uh, there's a, a lot of documentation, and if you have an outfitter that is not involved in this, you could end up uh, forfeiting your trophy. It becomes contraband if uh, if you haven't uh, done the right documentation. Uh, so there's uh, different permitting uh, processes that you'll need to uh, have the patience and, and file well in advance. Uh, one of the best ways to, uh, to, to achieve that uh, knowledge is to get a hold of a specialized uh, wildlife import broker. I mean, these folks are found in most countries uh, uh, around the world. So if you're a sheep hunter outside the U.S., you, there's people out there that understand the laws. And if you talk to them and tell them what you have in mind and where you're going, they're going to get you uh, a checklist on what you need to uh, uh, have in, the, in, the, in regards to paperwork and documentation to uh, import a trophy. Uh, you know, don't forget uh, Canada and Mexico are foreign countries. We kind of forget that sometimes. And uh, the uh, sheep in Mexico, the desert sheep, they're a CITES 2 animal, which means they have a, a, a special uh, uh, quota uh, of how many can be exported and imported per year based on uh, the individual outfitter and, and uh and the surveys they've done on the sheep to, to you know, justify the, that, uh, the removal and the moving of that animal. So it's, uh, this is done by uh, a, uh, an organization uh, that uh, some people don't really understand. Uh, well, the uh, IUCN, IUCN is the, uh, let's look at it as the conservation branch of the United Nations. And they've been around since uh, the early 1960s and are focused on uh, the welfare of uh, wildlife, timber, plants, uh, birds, you name it. Uh, we're interested in wild sheep, of course, but they have uh, uh, sp wildlife professional specialists that are, are, are looking at those populations of animals around the world. And that includes Canada. That includes Mexico. Uh, the Wild Sheep Foundation became a member of, a, of the um, uh, IUCN a couple of years ago, and uh, we've already had uh, uh, an impact on uh, the uh, uh, review and status of uh, sheep in, in uh, Canada, like the stone sheep, and are working on things that can help uh, the population and uh, help the hunter, and also in Mexico as well. Um, CITES uh, is... Uh, uh, a uh, regulatory branch of the IUCN, and they're in charge of issuing the, the actual document that's attached to a quota from a country that allows them to export uh, an animal from their country to a, another country. Uh, that's a one-time deal, one export, one import. Uh, a CITES permit uh, is uh, needed for uh, uh, some animals like an Ibex, uh, Argales, uh, some uh, uh, urials, but uh, it's something you want to ask. I mean, do you need a CITES permit? Uh, uh, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Import Permit is an additional permit that is a uh, involving the uh, Endangered Species Act and so forth. And uh, you know, animals like uh, a uh, argali are on the Appendix One, so they have the same uh, level of protection as a grizzly bear. So. It's, a, it's something you need to educate yourself about and be aware of uh, that as well. Not easy to be a sheep hunter, but uh, that's the name of the game. So he, also here we've got uh, the, uh, uh, a report that uh, we put together at the Wild Sheep Foundation to help you uh, make some decisions on when and where you might want to go. Uh, this covers the uh, wild sheep population status, uh, uh, COVID-19 and what travel might mean and the uh, impacts of, uh, of a, a 2020 season, which were largely canceled and uh, how that's going to affect uh, uh, space down the line. 
you know, in a nutshell, uh, there was uh, some spotty winter kill in Alaska and doll sheep. That's big country up there. There's always uh, great sheep hunting and parts of it everywhere. And that goes for anywhere that wild sheep live. Uh, these are really hardy animals. They're, of course, a very migratory animal. And there's always herds that are recovering from uh, some impact of winter and others that uh, are maybe just entering that. But your outfitter, uh, it will uh, understand uh, you know, what type of, uh, of uh, situation the, the sheep are in and make adjustments necessary. Uh, they may be adjusting to uh, a die-off uh, uh, of wild sheep in their area that happened seven to ten years ago, and that affects rams that would be in that legal age of uh, nine or ten years old. So you can pause on this if you want to read into this a bit more. Uh, things look good in uh, the uh, the northern Rockies as well uh, in BC and Alberta where we've uh, where we can hunt uh, 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 bighorn sheep over the counter by hiring an outfitter. And then also uh, the American West we had a lot of drought and so forth and thank God uh, Wild Sheep Foundation and other affiliates have been out there uh, building water supplies and helping uh, on uh, uh, preserving winter range for them. But so, uh, so the uh, bighorns are basically in pretty good uh, condition and stable. Uh, the same thing for uh, Eurasia and New Zealand, uh, where uh, well, some of our mount hunters will go. Uh, Asia has had a fairly open winter the last two years in a row. Uh, same uh, this winter, things are looking decent. Uh, unfortunately, due to the COVID travel relations uh, re regulations, uh, uh, New Zealand is is unlikely to open for their uh, second season in a row, uh, which runs from uh, January to May. And uh, uh, so we're we're worried about our friends in that part of the world. Uh, uh, they're pushing uh, clients that have been booked for the last two years out a couple of years. Uh, that's that impact to keep an eye on in, uh, in uh, your travel plans and so forth. Uh, space availability is, is an issue. Uh, lots of people booked hunts in uh, 2019, 2020, and uh, they've been postponed, and now they're rolled over to the next year or two years. So you may uh, be able to find a good uh, hunt that will suit you. But uh, don't be surprised if you're looking at uh, 2022. Uh, the, uh, the outfitters will let you know what they have. Maybe they've got something else uh, like a good uh, predator hunt uh, or a mountain goat or something to get you in the field and keep uh, our great outfitters uh, in the game. Uh, they're uh, going to be financially strapped, uh, unfortunately. Uh, support our folks. Uh, travel. Uh, you know, these, there's mandatory travel conditions with medicine, medicine um, and they've been around for years. Uh, uh, hunters have been used to this in a, in a lot of areas where you would need some proof of inoculation. Uh, most county health uh, and provincial health uh, agencies will have some type of a, a proof of inoculation certificate that uh, they can put uh, yellow fever or some uh, inoculation uh that uh, might uh, restrict your ability to go into an area if you don't have it. So I'm thinking that uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, is going to require uh, some type of certification that you've been vaccinated uh, and uh, are clean to come into the country. Uh, if you uh, if you don't have a yellow fever uh, uh, vaccine from a, a lot of uh, in uh, uh, a lot of areas of the world, you won't be able to board an airplane. They'll ask for it, uh, your passport first, and then that inoculation proof. So heads up on that. Uh, and one thing I, I want to point out is uh, one of the simplest ways you can help wild sheep is by booking a legal hunting trip for predators. I mean, this really helps uh, wild sheep. Uh, if you uh, look at this photo of this black bear, right over that black bear is a fawn deer that uh, is still alive because a hunter shot the bear that was looking for it. Uh, a single mountain lion can take up to uh, one wild sheep a week. That's 52 a year. When you look at how many herds of sheep are uh, found in, uh, in many areas of the American West, uh, 100 or 200 sheep is the total population. Yeah. Uh, you can do your part uh, just by hunting uh, 
predators. The most wild rams documented, to my knowledge, to be taken by wolves at a single location were 21 doll sheep. Uh, Wayne Heimer had pictures of that. Wayne was a field biologist in Alaska. Uh, but you can imagine uh, the impact on uh, the local sheep population. One pack of wolves had 21 rams. So a little bit about wild sheep fever. I've had it for years. Uh, uh, you, I hope you guys catch it as well if you don't already have it. Uh, I'm, I'm focused on lots of uh, wild sheep protection, believe me. Like here's a couple of my favorite wild sheep activities, hugging wolves and hanging with cats. You guys can do that too. You know, the cost of, to translocate a single wild sheep is about 500 or 5,000 bucks a year. Uh, and, and they're moved to areas where they may have been absent for 100 years. Take a look at the Wild Sheep Foundation. Take one, put one back. Uh, this is how we put sheep on the mountain and keep them there. So let's talk more about uh, travel, transport, permitting, horses. I mean, this is a classic photo here. People ask about bugs. Yeah, this is up in Alaska. And uh, they've got bragging-sized mosquitoes up in that area. Yeah, there's going to be bugs in some areas depending on the time you go. So uh, that's a, an a, a question you should be asking your outfitter. And then uh, we hunt sheep in a couple of different ways, backpack or horseback. Both get you into great hunting areas, there's no question. But uh, horses are uh, an interesting beast. People ask me what the most dangerous animal that uh, I've encountered uh, in my travels around the world, and I'll tell them a horse. Don't underrate a horse. They're a big, strong animal, and you need to have a working knowledge of them. Each horse uh, has a, you know, a, a personality of their own. Ask the outfitter if they're, what little quirky things they have before you jump on their back. They, they have a, 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 steering, uh, a steering apparatus, brakes, and a throttle, but uh, when was the last time you were on a horse? You might want to take some lessons if you haven't done it. If you're not horse savvy, a uh, little driver's head is in order. This is a classic uh, photo right here. This is in Tajikistan. If you look the fellow in the middle, he's got a wolf laying up over his lap there. They're, they play a game uh, of keep away, basically, two teams on horseback. And they, uh, they generally use a goat, but uh, uh, it's called Bushkazi. And uh, in this particular case, uh, the breakaway uh, player has got that wolf out and uh, is pulling away from the rest of the folks. Sure, we could uh, find a way to get you into the game if you're up to the task. Uh, with horses, sometimes several layers of transportation is needed. You can see this back, big old backpack there loaded up uh, with a, doll sheet, uh, a Wild Sheep Foundation logo on it, and they've uh, been packed in there with horses. Uh, sometimes it takes... Uh, a horse to get you 20 miles in and then too rough for the horse and you head for uh, the backpack and get yourself in there. So you do need to uh, make sure your level of fitness is as, as good as you can get it. When you're talking to an outfitter, make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into physically. And uh, because all, all people have not been created equal, there's no question. This, uh, this is a remote valley in Tajikistan where you can't get into it with uh, vehicles and they hunt on foot and horseback, but it's a sheep hunting merit and, a, and Ibex paradise. The terrain uh, on sheep hunting uh, can be a lot more rugged than you expected. In general, sheep hunting and any type of goat hunting is harder than you expect. So don't underestimate this. Uh, Make sure you've got the best equipment you could get. I mean, really keep an eye on your feet and good boots. Uh, make sure your backpack's fitted to you. Don't overload yourself. Get a packer or ask somebody to help you if you uh, just aren't feeling strong. A backpack camp is a must in some terrain. This uh, mountain goat uh, area up in Alaska is full of goats, but it's well protected by glacial country. and. Uh, there's ways to reach these areas by a, a boat or an aircraft and then hike into the areas. And uh, it's not uncommon to see 10, 20, 30 goats a day. Mountain goat hunting is a, a great way to experience uh, beautiful high country and remote awesome areas. And uh, you can pick up a goat hunt for nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000. Uh, do you want to sit there and wait to draw a goat tag? Uh, uh, all your life, or do you want to go uh, actually go goat hunting? It's, all it is is a, 
uh, it takes is a pick up the phone and start researching. Uh, here, here's, here's one that I wouldn't recommend. Walrus, I would not recommend for a backpack hunt. And we'll just leave that one where it is. So, and one of the things to ask your outfitter also is uh, what the present sheep population is and when the last winter kill occurred. I mentioned this earlier. It is a big deal. And, and your expectations. Some of the things uh, you should ask is uh, how many sheep you might see. You know, if you're on a doll sheep hunt, you might only see half a dozen rams and no ewes at all. Or you might see 100 or 200 uh, uh, ram lambs and ewes and and maybe one band of 10 rams. For the most part, if you see 10 rams, maybe two or three will be legal eight-year-old type rams. Uh, another question to ask is what the size of the animal is. Uh, as a rule, the laws on a legal sheep right now are full curl or double broomed or uh, eight years old or older and quite frankly that is a really nice old mature animal imagine uh, uh, if all you hunted was an eight and ten year old elk and deer so this just puts it in the right perspective uh, uh, you know if i if i hunt myself i try to target a 10 year old sheep i, I keep my tape measure back in the drawer at home uh, 40 inch rams seem to be the holy grail but in reality True 40-inch rams probably represent uh, two or three percent of the total number of rams taken anywhere in North America every year. 40 inches is rare. High five to people that can get one or one even bigger, and uh, uh, just keep trying if, if that's what you want. Uh, what's what a legal ram is an important consideration. Some areas uh, bighorns are uh, three-quarter curl, some they're four-fifths curl. Uh, these are all important things. Uh, uh, as a rule, if you're hunting uh, bighorn sheep, uh, the, the fastest growing rams will reach full curl, maybe about six years old. They might be unbroomed, and those are the legal sheep. Once they start to broom at that age, they may never reach full curl uh, and be legal ever again. So it's, it's a way of, of allowing uh, uh, open uh, quotas and, and uh, allowing people to, to the opportunity to hunt sheep but harvest can be challenging, so keep that uh, equation in the back of your mind. Another thing you need to consider is what happens if you wound a sheep? I mean, there's, uh, there's uh, more and more laws around the country uh, that uh, if you wound a ram, your, your tag is considered taken. Uh, this is something to, to really uh, keep in the back of your mind, particularly if you're taking long shots at game. I found most animals are hit closer to the tail than they are to the heart in the first place. So reconsider taking a long shot and do it the old fashioned way and try and get as close as you could get to them. Travel is a big deal. Uh, this is a, as a bush flight uh, up in uh, the Brooks Range. Uh, there's various uh, aircraft that will be used on a trip to get you in there. A, things, a few things to keep in mind with travel. With the commercial travel, don't, don't go on a, a, a frequent flyer a permit, a ticket. It's just uh, too many problems. It's just very common to not uh, uh, be able to fly on the uh, dates you expect or to change a ticket because you've been delayed and, and so forth. It's an endless uh, source of problem. Buy an airplane ticket that you can change for a reasonable fee. Uh, when, once you get to the area, you'll probably be hopping on an air charter somewhere to fly into the area. So it's pretty inevitable. Air charters a lot of times are, are based on two or three hunters flying at the same time, and they're cost sharing it. And if you arrive late and have a solo flight, what happens then? That thousand or two thousand uh, dollar charter flight might be uh, the burden, your burden now, and it could cost you two, three, four thousand dollars. Make sure you arrive a day or so early. Make sure that, you're, that way you know your luggage is with you and that uh, uh, you have more options and so forth. Uh, aircraft like this also have a, a weight limit. A Super Cub will handle a couple of uh, adults and maybe another 100, 150 pounds safely. So uh, packing light is a really big deal. Uh, 
leave heavy weight equipment at home or leave, uh, if you have heavy equipment uh, or travel equipment, leave it at the hotel that you fly into and make arrangements to have it stored there. Same with heavy gun cases. Get some type of a gun sock or light uh, uh, rifle uh, case to uh, ship your gun in to keep it protected. Uh, a, a, a beaver is an aircraft that can handle about a thousand pounds. Well, you know, do the do the math on it. A couple, two or three people, and you've uh, filled it up with uh, them and their gear. So let's talk about the sheep. You know, desert sheep, this is really a big deal. I mean, not that many years ago, there were very few over-the-counter uh, uh, licenses. Sonora virtually had no sheep, as did Kohila or Chihuahua. Uh, it's just amazing what the, the uh, uh, landowners have done in the last 20 years. I mean, they basically have uh, invested their time and money and uh, have done countless game captures and moved the animals onto their property. So there's more and more great properties that now have uh, very viable wild sheep populations. Uh, the, uh, the fair chase areas are, are abundant and, and there's really some big rams taken. Uh, some of the biggest rams taken in, uh, in all time have occurred in the last few years. Some of these ranches have great forage, have not had cattle or domestic goats on their, their ranch for maybe up to 50 years. So you can imagine uh, what that translates to uh, in really top habitat. Um, here's Doug Sayre with a great big old ram from uh, uh, from Kohila. And uh, uh, he's a, a fellow that really enjoys uh, hunting sheep and uh, hunting uh, desert sheep is a, a great escape. Here's another great uh, area, the Carmen Island uh, uh, off the coast of Baja. That's, uh, that's Baja in the background out there in the Sea of Cortez in the background. This is a buddy of mine that I hunted with, and uh, uh, it's rugged, rugged terrain, I can tell you. Uh, he had uh, Jack O'Connor's 270 load and uh, knew where his rifle shot, and he shot from that canyon wall across the way took us two hours to reach the ram after he shot it. So it gives you an idea of just uh, what the terrain might be. Great, great ram, really a fun trip. Let's talk about what's a fanon sheep. Well, here's a picture of my buddy Craig Boddington and a picture of myself. Both of these rams were taken in the northern end of the, of the colored or stone sheep range and so forth. And in that area, you start getting some hybridization of, of colors and so forth. And uh, you know, some uh, fan and sheep uh, can be uh, the color of a, a pair of faded blue jeans, or uh, I've seen them that look like they had a, race in, a dark racing stripe down the middle of their back. Uh, these animals, a colored sheep is considered to be a stone sheep by Boone and Crockett, and uh, most people do as well. But people need another reason, sheep hunters need another reason to uh, hunt sheep. So fanon's a great excuse to, to uh, get yourself up in sheep country. And uh, as you can see, these sheep in this northern range, they have whiter bellies, uh, white necks, really pretty animals. If you crawl up on a herd of rams, uh, 10, 15 rams, you might have uh, sheep from, uh, from the color of uh, faded blue jeans to jet black. So be prepared for uh, a real variety of colors. When they come to the colors, think about black bear, cinnamon bear, brown bear, it's kind of the same thing is what it comes down to. California bighorn sheep options. Uh, these animals are, uh, are, are, are an animal that was transplanted from uh, drier uh, terrains in uh, California, Oregon, parts of Idaho, Washington. And uh, the over-the-counter stuff is up in BC and the sheep herds are uh, in pretty good shape, although I hear there's some uh, uh, some uh, movie moving through some of the populations now, which is really disheartening. But uh, rams like this uh, have been fairly common the last few years. This fellow came clear from South Africa to hunt uh, a good uh, California bighorn. They count as a, a bighorn sheep, a Rocky Mountain sheep, or if uh, again, if you're looking for another reason, go sheep hunting. 
why not go California bighorn hunting? Uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. Uh, this one is taken up in uh, southeast BC. It's a big record ram. There's not a lot of these big record rams around. A, a full curl ram uh, is, uh, is, is a legal ram. Uh, you can see there's lots of timber, steep mountains in the country, and lots of room around the sheep. Uh, bighorn sheep hunts in BC and Alberta are doing uh, pretty well. Most of the hunts I see are thirty-five to forty-five thousand uh, dollars. That's uh, cheaper than a new pickup, by the way. Uh, doll sheep options. Well, I, I've got to tell you, I love hunting doll sheep. I mean, there's so many places to go. Uh, I've tried to hunt every mountain range in uh, Alaska and the Yukon uh, since I went on my first doll sheep hunt uh, back in 1970. Uh, there's uh, some really great areas to hunt. A couple things to keep in mind. Uh, the, uh, uh, the number of sheep uh, is uh, 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 stable in most areas. Uh, the number of sheep hunters has been pretty stable, even going back to 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, the uh, outfitters are actually taking less hunters than they were uh, just because of uh, permitting and so forth and making sure there's enough uh, uh, opportunity for uh, residents and non-residents to enjoy uh, hunting wild sheep. Uh, if you're hunting in Alaska and you take a ram, you have to wait four years to you take another ram. And they also uh, do not allow uh, flying and scouting for sheep uh, after the opening day, which is August 10th. So that means uh, you're going to have to find uh, rams the old-fashioned way and have to out the aid, aid of an airplane. There's nothing wrong with that. Just uh, make sure you take a hunt that uh, is long enough to uh, uh, give up a few days to fog and so forth. Alaska. Uh, and uh, the Yukon and Northwest Territories uh, have sheep about the pr pretty much the same size. It's more of an apples to apples. If they're eight years old, uh, most of the rams are going to be 34 to 36, 37 inches. A few rams will get up 38 to 39 inches. Over 39 inches is really rare. And uh, be prepared to come home without a sheep if you've set your sights on uh, rams over 40 inches. Uh, for a lot of folks, that's not a problem, but uh, uh, a, a doll sheep hunt in Alaska right now is going to be somewhere around $25,000, maybe a bit less uh, in the uh, Canadian areas, a bit more. Uh, their uh, areas are uh, uh, concessions, as they're known as. They're uh, uh, a commodity up there, and they sell for uh, sometimes millions of dollars. Uh, Alaska has uh, uh, some uh, areas that are concessions that uh, well, there's only one area, uh, one outfitter allowed them as well. So it's pretty similar, but those uh, require uh, just a crafty uh, uh, drafting of a uh, operating plan in the area. And uh, so the, it's, a, it's a bit cheaper there. Uh, international travel. Uh, this is something... Uh, uh, a lot of folks actually uh, are choosing, uh, uh, they don't start hunting sheep in, uh, in North America. They, they end up going to Asia to hunt other animals because some of these sheep hunts are significantly cheaper. So uh, my advice to people that are going to go to uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Pamirs or areas of Central Asia, uh, Spain, Turkey, Eastern Europe, it's unbelievable how many opportunities you'd have to hunt there. But uh, again, uh, don't use frequent flyer tickets uh, in most destinations. You never know where they're going to route you through. Well, there's, these airlines have partners, and they might end up uh, flying you into a city that has a ban on firearms. Cities own the airports, and they have their own rules. So following a really uh, uh, predictable Route flying is a pretty much a must if you're bringing rifles with you. If you want to use a loaner rifle, well, you can uh, flit around before or after. But uh, if you're going to bring your own rifle, then uh, make sure that you uh, really look into uh, uh, what the, the most direct uh, way to fly is. Uh, the booking exact travel rights uh, routes are really important. 
yes, there's going to be visas. Some are cheap. Some take a little more time and effort to get them done. Some you get on arrival. It just depends on the country and the relationship they have with uh, whatever country you uh, live in. Gun permits are pretty easy to get as long as you get the information to the outfitter well in advance. Uh, there will be probably uh, limitations on the amount of ammunition you can bring with you. 30, 40 rounds is pretty typical. Uh, uh, keep in mind with your airline tickets, sometimes if you're uh, even flying and doing in transit in some uh, cities of Europe or um, the Middle East and so forth, uh, in transit permits to travel through uh, their cities uh, is, uh, it requires permits as well. So ask questions. Uh, I recommend uh, booking trips uh, through uh, travel agents that are uh, really, really specialized in uh, traveling with uh, firearms and are uh, uh, pretty ho close to the, the issue and, and can react if there's uh, changes. And they can happen at any time. Airlines can change their rules uh, uh, overnight, literally. So that's some of the negatives, but uh, just be prepared for those uh, issues. Uh, the, the use of... Uh, short lake takeoff and landing aircraft like our super cubs and uh, beavers here in, the, in this country uh, they just uh, that's not something you see uh, much in uh, anywhere in europe or in eurasia and so forth they use helicopters primarily and i got to tell you people are a little bit leery about it but most of the helicopters they're, they're using are a lot newer than a lot of the bush flight bush planes i see used in north america so keep that in mind uh, they have large, uh, large helicopters, some smaller ones for fewer people, but inevitably uh, it's, it's potentially uh, uh, something you're going to be using on a hunt. Here's my buddy uh, Kevin Rinke with a great big old uh, snow sheep from uh, the Koryak Mountain Range in Siberia. You know, if you're looking to hunt sheep and want to go more than once, uh, one of these uh, snow sheep is pretty similar to hunting uh a, a doll sheep in the Brooks Range or Alaska in terms of terrain. There's not a lot of brush, not a lot of glacial act activity. So it's a fairly open country. Uh, the animals are pretty uh, uh, robust in numbers, uh, but it's still a sheep hunt. Uh, some backpacking can be expected. But a sheep hunt for these animals is uh, uh, about the same price as a doll sheep hunt, you know, plus or minus a, a thousand bucks or so of uh, $2,500. And uh, we've had uh, uh, actually a flight through Anchorage to uh, Petropavlos uh, the last few years that just operates uh, in a short window from uh, late July to early September. You can fly over there in about four hours from Anchorage for fifteen, eighteen hundred dollars round trip. Uh, the only drawback is there's only one flight a week, but you can do uh, a sheep hunt and time it to to be there. Uh, say two weeks, you can do a second sheep uh, and be there three weeks. Uh, there are flights through uh, Moscow and other uh, Asian cities, uh, so you could get into Petro or uh, uh, other uh, Siberian areas, and uh, there's daily flights. So depending on where you live, that might be worth looking at. But this is a great hunt to consider. Chamois uh, are really a beautiful animal. You know, they only weigh probably 60, 80 pounds, but there's all kinds of different chamois species uh, scattered from, uh, from Spain, France, Switzerland, Turkey, a lot of the Balkan states into the Caucasus Mountains. And these are a cheaper animal to hunt and, a, and really a neat animal to tie into a, 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 a a vacation with your family. I mean, some of the, uh, some of the areas found on the, uh, on the this ocean front in these areas are absolutely beautiful be beaches and you could book a three or four day hunt and get up into uh, chamois country and, and uh, uh, chase these little uh, goats around. They're really uh, a beautiful animal and uh, well worth uh, taking the effort to go hunt them. But I tell people all the time, if you're going to go uh, on a hunting trip just about anywhere, the first thing you need to pack is your patience stuff happens that saying really applies to hunters you can see these folks are buried in the snow you never know what you're going to run into weather is a big factor and just uh, figure that you're going to lose some days no matter what 
Uh, make sure you have the right style gear for the style of hunting. I mean, this is kind of a classic shot years ago. Uh, I was in uh, to, in the uh, Qinghai province in China in the mid-1980s, and uh, uh, we were out hunting blue sheep and, uh, and came across this winter kill hot Sony ram. Uh, my buddy Mike Murphy there has got the rifle on his shoulder. Those folks uh, in that part of the world uh, don't believe in rifle scabbards, so you're going to carry your rifle over your shoulder, or you can have your guide carry it. And uh, these people are, are the ones that uh, tamed horses and learned to ride them, but they, their saddles are a little bit different than you'd expect. Non-adjustable stirrups, uh, can be a little cramped on a six foot five uh, American guy. Another shot from that part of the world. This is one of the most remarkable mountain beasts I've seen, these uh, Tibetan yaks. They're the largest of all the mountain animals I've encountered. A, a big yak like this winter kill uh, will reach around 3,000 pounds. That's 30% that's bigger than the biggest bison around. They're immense animals. This one had uh, horns over 45 inches long on each side. You can see the size of the skull. Uh, I've saw herds of them at uh, up to 21,000 feet. And in the same terrain, you'd expect to see an ibex or a sheep. Ibex are a really cool animal. Uh, smart, I'd say they're smarter than sheep and uh, really well worth hunting. They have, ibex have the largest horns per body size of any of the Capernet species. And for that matter, is bigger horns per body size than any other horned animal on the planet. So if they live long enough, they grow about three inches a year, you get a 15-year-old, 16-year-old uh, ibex. It can be a pretty impressive beast. And uh, one of the great things about uh, hunting ibex, there's lots of different species scattered from Spain clear to uh, the uh, Sion Mountains in Russia and uh, lots of different species to visit. And uh, most of the hunts are around uh, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 or less. Uh, so probably the, the most interesting area to hunt, uh, uh, we'll, we'll call them ibex for a reference point, it would be in Spain where you could do up to four different species in about 10 days. Uh, this, uh, this slide is of, uh, of uh, uh, animals that people refer to as ibex, but they're actually true wild goats. Wild goats are a little bit different than uh, Ibex, they, they grow similar horns, uh, and, but uh, they tend to have this uh, multicolored uh, fur, uh, the, the chest stripe around them. The animal on the left-hand side is a bezoar ibex in Turkey. They don't underrate the hunting uh, uh, of this animal. At the, they live in a, some pretty brushy country, juniper with cliffy areas. Uh, they're challenging. They're best hunted in... Uh, November, early December, when they're rutting and uh, chasing nannies up onto cliffs and uh, and uh, tree treeless uh, mountains and so forth. Then they get in the spring, uh, like in March, it can be a really great time to hunt them. Uh, they'll they'll grow horns up to over fifty inches long and weigh uh, maybe a hundred hundred and ten pounds. The animal on the right is a, a Bassetti ibex taken near uh, Valencia, Spain, on the on the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea. So it, this is a great place to take a, a non-hunter. You travel uh, across Spain, uh, which is one of the top tourist areas in the world. They have hunting seasons in the fall, clear up to May in the spring. Great food, diverse area. They love Americans, Canadians, you name it. Great place to hunt. A uh, typical uh, Ibex. So there is a about $8,500 for a, a really good mature animal, maybe a bit more in some areas. Here's another uh, shot of a, this is a true ibex. This is found in Central Asia. You can see the hide is much darker in color. There's some blending of hair, but it doesn't have that chest stripe quite as uh, dramatically. And uh, these animals get big. Uh, uh, I've seen ibex that were approaching the size of a Marco Polo physically. This is a monster 50 inch class animal, really heavy horns. You'll see uh, animals with bases over 11 inches. Uh, terrific place to hunt. Uh, this animal would be in Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, 
Mongolia up into the Sion. Don't forget uh, Pakistan and uh, in the Himalayan areas. Uh, they have a really great population as well. Uh, and these again are an animal, ten, twelve thousand dollars. Uh, you can shoot a second one for about forty-five hundred bucks and see the world without uh, breaking the bank. Uh, here's a, a, a argali from Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia has the largest sheep in the world, the the Altai argali, but uh, they're a hungai uh, found in the central part of the country and the Gobi. None of them are slouches, and a lot of them have uh, unbelievably massive horns. Right now, there's uh, over 250 Argali hunting permits available yearly in Mongolia, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. And Kazakhstan is building a conservation strategy right now using uh, 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 conservation uh, hunting uh, as a tool. And they have a number of different uh, uh, Argali species, and uh, we're hopeful to see uh, this open to uh, hunters that can help uh, pass our conservation model uh, to their area and enjoy uh, a great hunting uh, uh, trip and uh, and help the wildlife. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about camps for a second. Well, it's kind of odd. Here's an elephant uh, in a uh, sheep picture. There's there's no no elephants, no gorillas in sheep camps, but uh, bears, mm, yeah, maybe. So uh, the message is uh, uh, you might have to be dealing with a bear. I suggest uh, purchasing a bear tag, maybe a black bear or grizzly. Talk to your outfitter about it, as you might be in charge of bear proof in camp. It, it does happen. Uh, bears like uh, the same food we do, and they've shown uh, that they're not afraid to uh, get some of it. So if you're going into one of these areas, I personally like to bring a 30 caliber rifle with me. Uh, I feel a little undergunned with a 6.5 caliber rifle when I've got a 500 pound bear that I, I might be uh, in charge of dealing with. Not every guide brings a back a, a rifle with them. Uh, some do, some don't. But this is just something to keep in the back of your mind in the mix. You probably won't have any problem with bears. However, uh, a little preventative uh, planning uh, might be uh, in uh, in order so you keep it in mind the uh, the outdoor toilets staying clean and camps and uh, camp food it's a mixed bag on a sheep hunt and an ibex hunt you might be uh, in some camps in central asia where you have a an actual house or some type of a building that's got indoor plumbing and heating and spain of you could probably stay at a castle, but so it's really not as big of an issue there. But a lot of areas you're going to be in remote areas and hunting for a long time, and uh, you have to deal with uh, uh, staying healthy and so forth. This photograph is a mule deer down in the Beartooth Mountains that I took a photo of, and yes, that is a toilet seat around her neck. Uh, she was hanging around camp, and apparently she'd hung around too many camps, and uh, somebody left a porta potty in the woods and she uh, was way too inquisitive. I considered uh, grabbing her and pulling the seat off, but uh, I wanted to be able to continue my sheep hunt with uh, uh, bumps and bruises that I caused and not some uh, 120 pound uh, doe deer. So but basically uh, the uh, uh, one of my favorite inventions in the, in the modern world now is these uh, uh, little wipes that you can bring along. You can give yourself a pretty good bath and stay healthy and keep your feet clean and make your partners in camp real happy to be around you all the time. So that's something I'd always recommend uh, bringing along all the time. Camp food is uh, a mix. The, probably the smartest thing to bring is, uh, de de uh, is to use, I should say, is uh, freeze-dried food. It's pretty darn good anymore. It doesn't go bad on you. It's lightweight and so forth. Uh, some folks still try to bring, uh, you know, real food, we'll call it along, eggs, bacon, this and that. But keeping a lot of those products uh, from uh, uh, going bad, uh, it's still summertime uh, or early uh, autumn and, and uh, food can be a bit of a problem. Uh, people ask me about uh, sheep meat and so forth and they want to bring it home. Well, you can bring it home in some areas, Canada and Alaska. It can work out, but uh, in reality, in some areas, 
the animal is really not yours to take home until the animal has been uh, uh, re uh, reviewed by the game department and plugged, and then it really becomes your animal. So uh, sometimes uh, you might not be able to bring meat home because you uh, haven't had a chance to uh, get it plugged and, uh, and, uh, and processed by the game department, and uh, that's something to keep in mind. And quite frankly, uh, most uh, sheep I've seen in North America will have about 50, 60 pounds of meat on a maximum. And I can tell you that uh, sheep hunters eat a lot of red meat over that uh, freeze-dried food. A lot of times there's not much sheep meat going to come home with anybody. They eat it all. It's, it's basically uh, used up by the camp. So keep that in mind. There's nowhere to keep it anyhow to keep it froze. If you do get to bring home, some home with you, you can bring it to a, a hotel. Usually if they have a restaurant attached to it, they'll throw it in the freezer uh, in the restaurant, and you can get it froze and get it home. Uh, there's uh, Most of the time, uh, uh, camp toilets uh, are uh, the, the dig a hole and bury it type thing, so uh, be prepared for that. I always brought an ice axe with me as my walking stick, and it made a pretty good trowel as well. So, But if you have any specialized diets, make sure that uh, you uh, discuss this with your outfitter. There's not a large pantry with lots of options available. Uh, leave the booze at home would be my recommendation. You're going to be working too hard for it uh, on, a, on a sheep hunt as a rule. Uh, it's, uh, it just doesn't fit into it. Uh, spike camps work fantastic uh, for uh, getting you close to the animal. You can spot a ram right out the front door. I've seen it happen many times. Shot two rams with no boots on myself. Could be a dirt floor in the camp, uh, no heat. Look at these Nippalaz uh, packers, uh, you know, and they're using uh, baskets and trump lines to pack gear. That's a uh, blue sheep meat uh, jerky uh, drying there in the area. Uh, Nepal is a great place for a, a hunting trip. Here's a nice blue sheep. Camps can be a little of everything. Uh, you can see the little Tajik uh, camp on the left is uh, Saudis, tents, uh, you name it, uh, whatever works. But uh, again, you could take a ram right out the front door of this camp, and I've seen it happen. They're usually pretty spartan. I like a fly over my camp uh, so I can stand up and get out of the rain, even if I have the best rain gear. It, uh, it feels good to have a, a, that dry as well. You might be in a cave. This is my wife, Cindy, out hunting. No, no tent to set up. You can stay pretty comfy. Uh, good planning can lead to a huge reward. Here's a, here's a high altai, the biggest of the biggest uh, from uh, Mongolia. Uh, have a backpack fitted to your build. This is really important. I mean, everybody's built differently. I don't recommend people getting a backpack any bigger than 6,000 cubic inches, unless you're Man Mountain Dean. It's pretty hard to carry it. Uh, if the bigger the backpack, the more your friends want you to take some of their stuff. And with, and with lightweight gear, don't bring uh, so much lightweight gear you can't pick up your pack. Good optics and a good rifle uh, that are lightweight, as far as I'm concerned, they cost nothing and weigh nothing. Really important. Be prepared to do a lot of glassing, often at great distance. It's not uncommon for uh, a sheep outfitter and guide to be showing you sheep that are two to four miles away. And then it takes half a day just to get there. If you don't have a 60 power scope, you might walk half a day just to find that the rams are three quarter curl and burn up a, a lot of energy and burn a day at the same time. The game is often really hard to spot. They uh, blend in really well. Uh, uh, you know, a white mountain goat and a white sheep on a white mountain, boom, man, bad news. Same for these brown colored, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, desert ibex. Game can appear from nowhere, anytime. You just never know, always be prepared. Be ready to shoot at a moment's notice. Uh, the people seem to struggle with having a, a rifle on a backpack. I like one that I can get to just about as quick as I could if I didn't have the backpack on. So I, I uh, would look at how you want to uh, hang your rifle on your uh, 
on your back really carefully, and I want instant access to it. Uh, being uh, being uh, vigilant to uh, the animal after you shoot it, you can see this mountain goat down on this cliffy area. It's not the right time to take that goat. Wait till you know that the, a tumble will not destroy the trophy. I mean, if you uh, these animals will bed in cliffs, and they'll generally get up every few hours, and they'll drift over towards a, a terrain that's maybe a bit more uh, uh, moderate and to, uh, where the grass will grow, and, uh, and keep that in mind. And if you take it a, a white animal or even a dark color one, blood stains the animal permanently, and uh, you need to uh, try and wash it out on at the kill site or if there's a creek or lake uh, nearby, rinse the animal out and... Uh, uh, and let it drip dry and watch the horns and capes. I've seen lots of people lose uh, hard-won goat and sheep capes and even horns and so forth. A wolverine or a bear or a camp dog, they just love the nose on a sheep cape. Uh, it does happen. Hang it up, bring it to bed with you, uh, you name it, but uh, defend it. It's yours to lose. Uh, yes, it can be uh, mentally taxing. I mean, this is a, uh, a tur hunt in Azerbaijan in December, maybe not the best time to uh, consider hunting a mountain animal. But uh, I went and uh, got this ram and uh, what a trip. Uh, the uh, snow camel was really helpful on a lot of hunts uh, in the Pamirs or uh, even in Mongolia. The uh, Argolis often look white or really light colored in a distance and you can fool them a mile or two out and maybe be able to pull off an unapproachable un stock. Uh, same goes for uh, sheep here in North America in, in areas where big horns around goats, a white animal would appear harmless. Stones, dolls, even mountain goat hunting, you can get away with murder sometimes. Uh, what I do is buy a pair of white painters uh, uh, coveralls and uh, they're cheap and lightweight and uh, uh, they're uh, you can throw them in a backpack and uh, use them if you need them uh, step three we've talked about step one and two of booking a hunt now you've uh, went through all these different options of where to go what to do what kind of camp you might need and you're gonna buy the trip and most outfitters have a pretty good contract these days It'll cover uh, the payments, deposits, when and where you're supposed to uh, hunt, when it begins, when it ends, cancellation policies and refunds. Read this carefully. It's a legal contract. Uh, if they don't have it, find a new outfitter. That's the bottom line on it. Other th policies you should be looking at is uh, air, uh, air charter costs and conditions and who you pay, uh, trophy fee costs for second or third animals or a, an extra animal and uh, and having licenses in advance. What happens if you wound and lose an animal? That's a big deal. It happens, unfortunately. Get close, like I said earlier. What happens if you arrive late or miss a flight and end up with a char uh, solo air charter? Then you can throw in uh, volcanoes, forest fires, uh, emergency season closures, and then like this year, the big one, the, pandic the pandemic that shut everything down. These things do happen. I've seen it uh, in the last uh, 50 years. If it can happen, it will happen. The remedy, in my mind, don't go on a hunting trip that you can't afford to eat if you can't go without buying uh, trip insurance. Ensure your hunt for cancellation for any reason and make sure you have evacuation insurance. It's a, it's a big deal. And finally, uh, I'm going to wrap it up now. Hell yeah, you can do it. Uh, I mentioned it's hard, but if you really want to try, you're not going to get a ram setting home watching the Packers play the Vikings. And, and uh, so get yourself uh, motivated and, and find a place that you can go. Maybe a horseback hunt is better for someone that's a little older or has uh, some bad knees. Uh, this fellow uh, went up and shot this beautiful ram uh, on a horseback hunt. And as you can see, I mean, they're going to ride that horse right up to it to pick it up. It, it can be that easy or it can be tough. Uh, last year, uh, I had one outfitter that had four hunters over 70 years old in camp. 
and they killed three rams and a couple grizzlies and you know it's it's it is possible uh, uh if you're an older person uh talk to your outfitter about a uh, payment plan uh i worked uh, two to three jobs uh in my uh, youth so i could go sheep hunting every year and if you really want to go you can do it and uh, uh i think sheep hunting is the highest form of, of hunting that there is you have to rise to the level of the animal uh, there's nothing easy about it, but it's incredibly rewarding. And uh, I, I, I hope to see you on the mountain someday. So this wraps it up for me. Uh, this, uh, this is a pre-recorded uh, uh, presentation, but uh, you can get a hold of me uh, and uh, uh, through the Wild Sheep Foundation or call uh, Atchison's in uh, Montana. And uh, there's other folks in my business uh, that do a great job. Or again, a lot of those outfitters are out there. They're anxious to help you. Outfitters are really good people uh, and are people, persons, let's put it that way. So you'll feel at home right away with these folks.